Thank you for joining us today for the PPM Insights webcast. You can join us on the second Thursday of every month at 11 Eastern uh, for a lively half hour with leading PPM experts so you get some fresh perspectives and expert takes on project and portfolio topics. Plus, we have some questions that can be answered uh, during the live Q&A at the end. So this week's featured expert is Eric Kissel. Um, and uh, Eric, is a current industry thought leader you may already know as the PPM warrior. He is also a CA services architect and a former customer practitioner, so he has been in your shoes before. And he's also consulted with a lot of diverse organizations, so he's seen it all when it comes to PPM. And he believes that the most common thread for solution value is all about adoption. So Eric, today you're going to share some insights and tips on how to improve poor data to achieve richer outcomes, and I'm very curious what you mean by that. Um, but first, can you explain more about why PPM is a human story? You, you talk about that a lot, and how that's going to tie into the discussion today. Hey, Lisa, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending. Yeah, uh, I absolutely foundationally believe that PPM and our ecosystem that we get to live and breathe every day is absolutely a human story. Just consider other ERPs, other processes within our business unit um, or within our organizations or within our lives. Um, think about the interaction of the diverse people and personas and use cases that we deal with within PPM we might have a timesheet user who logs in once a week, if that, <laughs> or on their phone, right, who doesn't need uh, a lot of um, information or training or has a different expectation of their uh, value that they're investing in the organization. Right next door to a PM uh, who's in doing uh, executive level, level reporting and risk mitigation. Right next door to a resource manager who might be in the system almost daily um, uh, dealing with resource constraints uh, and understanding uh, some capitalization, right, decisions. Uh, right next door to the financial and portfolio teams, understanding capacity management, et cetera, right? So PPM is absolutely a human story, and within everything that we do from a system and from a process perspective, we need to put them at the center of it. Today I'm going to talk about a concept that I've really kind of grown to love and I've been able to implement a few times. And it's called the management operating system. This is one of the key foundations I find when I work towards improving core data to uh, achieve rich outcomes. This is absolutely applicable if we are new or if we are maturing or if we want to even simplify our offering. Understanding our overall ecosystem and how things are connected beyond just uh, process click or step-by-step -step example, really enables our organization to uh, maximize the value and minimize the effort. So we'll be going through some general topics. I think they'll click with you. You've seen this. This should make sense to all of us. I'm hoping to share with you today, though, some simple samples. <laughs> and sorry, I used that term a couple times here but you can uh, use it yourself, right? Hopefully you can adopt it and adapt it. Quickly, uh, and I, I'm going to read a paragraph. I did this for my last presentation regarding organizational readiness, but I think it's, it's apropos. Uh, delivering valuable project and portfolio management outcomes depends on several factors. Process and system maturity, appetite for investment, leader and team skills, understanding user pain and value propositions, internal politics, uh, and changes in reporting structures or key initiatives. The list goes on. We've all been there, done that, right? It even includes changing tools or pivoting to agile and DevOps methodologies. As practitioners, we may be in a constant state of flux, which we are, right? Uh, but we're, uh, sometimes we're in monotony, and that is risk. Today, we're going to discuss achieving reachieving and transparently demonstrating benefits from PPM processes and systems through an adoptable and adaptable management operating system. All right, so I wrote a few quotes. These are all mine, so use them as you see fit. 
Uh, people are at the center, and we must define and visualize a management operating system. We're going to talk today about rhythm, context, flow, and detailed steps. So before we get into the pretty pictures, the management operating system is a lot more than just what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about things, images, graphics, uh, uh, and flows that have resonated uh, with my customers, and I think might be uh, uh, that little 5% extra that you can give to put you over the top when communicating your PPM ecosystem processes, but there's a lot more to it. So I want to uh, make sure to call that out. So within the uh, MOS, why does it matter? Well, with processes, we need to focus on the input, the output, and the what. So for us, the input is all about adoption of the process and tool. We do that by simplification activities, and again, within our designs, within our thought processes, people are at the center of the ecosystem. Obviously, the people are what generally are doing the inputs and making the investments. The outputs, uh, or hopefully the ROI, right, comes in its insights and foresights, uh, oftentimes optimized by leadership decisions. And then we move into maturity and PPM investment with a roadmap. So how do we do that and really what is that? Again, we're going to be talking about this. We're going to discover how value pulls input or how our uh, desired outcomes drive what efforts we're putting into our processes and system. We're going to make connections between people, processes, and tools. And yes, our ecosystems are connected. But it's really important uh, and beneficial to us to communicate those connections consistently uh, between those different personas, right, because they're diverse, those different processes, and most often there's different tools within our ecosystem. It might be Agile Central, it might be a financial system, it might be SharePoint, et cetera. We're going, about, we're going to talk about adding context for our operating rhythms more than just a Visio. We're going to talk about policies, procedures, and then why and when those are happening. And I'm going to share uh, some kind of insider strategies. Really, it's important to understand um, the industry is constantly moving, and many of us are making investments, uh, working towards simplifying or working towards enhancing or working towards our roadmap. But some of us are not, and not is not really an option because the change is going to pass us over. So we tend to fall into the situation where as is um, becomes negative without us even realizing it. On the bottom, you see three pillars. Um, this is what it is. When I work with customers, these are generally my deliverables, the artifacts that I work towards. Um, but I want to call out on the left bottom, it says things you can deliver to your organization. These are things that I'm sharing with you that you can do, just like I do. You'll also see um, a really uh, uh, common theme here. <laughs> I like to keep things simple at a high level and then break it down. So we've got three pillars here, define, design, and optimize. When I'm communicating this approach to customers, it takes a second. It's going to take a second for you, right? But if we can start our conversation uh, at a simplistic level, defining terminology, then uh, we can actually make steps forward. So one deliverable or workshop or activity that I do is defining the overview and operating principles of our PPM ecosystem. Operating principles are really important. Uh, next, definitions and outcomes. So uh, define what our words are, where we're trying to go, why we're trying to get there. And understand our capabilities. So really scope our, if they're services that we're offering, or if we actually own the processes, but scope what our capabilities are. Many organizations, PMOs, are moving from kind of an owned resource and an owned process and an owned tool model into a service model. Many organizations, and honestly almost everyone I've ever dealt with, does not have a, a fully centrally managed PMO. It's, it's usually satellites or island PMOs. 
But then the thought leadership within the PPM, tool owners or the process owners, can offer as a service leading practices. So, for example, the presentation I'm giving now could be considered a service to you where I don't own any of your deliverables or your organization, but I can provide some guidance to you and then you ultimately choose. Next is design. I'm gonna focus on these things because I think these are gonna be most impactful for you. Uh, we're gonna show some examples of contextualized processes. Again, this is not rocket science. You've probably thought of this already, but hopefully I can um, spur a couple, a couple uh, tweaks that you can implement yourself that'll push you over the edge of quality. Usability and persona-based experience via security. We've all dealt with this. We all know that the experience and usability of the tool is very important, but it's just as important for the process as well. So we need to be counting clicks, both with the process as well as the tool, et cetera. So that's part of design. Uh, integrations, of course, and then on the optimized side, roadmap, maturity ROIs, and success measures. So we're going to focus most, though, on that middle top bullet today. All right, first image, simple sample operating rhythm. So if we're trying to figure out how to increase poor data to make um, uh, valuable output, we need to actually tie those two things. And what you're seeing here is a lot. So I'm gonna break it down and explain it to you. But this is what I literally whiteboard with customers when we're talking about uh, their processes or what they, what they wanna do. For example, here, really simple. We wanna do a project status reports and have them roll up for an ELP meeting. That's pretty standard, right? So this is what a whiteboard would look like to that. But there's some key elements that a lot of people don't include that I'm going to argue really adds value. The first piece here is this rhythm. It's important to have a drumbeat and to communicate a rhythm of activity so people kind of know what and when, where and how, and then eventually why uh, we're doing our activities. You can see there's representation one, two, three, four. That might be a week. This might be a calendar of a month, right? That could represent months or quarters, right? The point here is we want to identify a rhythm for activities and then get them on the calendar. <laughs> All right, next, we're gonna focus on this last piece. Oftentimes, when we're talking about an implementation, we talk about uh, the what. So in this case, we, we would talk about doing the status report. But instead, we should be talking about the why and then how it's going to uh, improve. This is pulling us. If you can visualize a string pulling uh, right, uh, pulling the left to the right, so the reason we're doing everything to the left of this leadership review is because of the input we need for that process and then ultimately the output, which is going to be our value. When we're communicating to a project manager or to a PMO or a group, we want to include the entire ecosystem here. We're going to focus on uh, what they need to do or how they need to do it as described on the bottom. And that uh, Chevron might look familiar. I used that in my org readiness presentation last month as well. Uh, it's the same concept, right? It's how we're communicating, uh, what these impacts are, as well as um, uh, how it fits within the ecosystem. So I encourage you to reference that presentation as well. So, for, so when we're communicating to a project manager that they have to do a weekly status report, for example, before the what, before we show them how to click, we want to tell them why and how it's improving our organization and the impact that their uh, investment and good attitude uh, and, and feedback are going to have. So it's the opposite way of talking about things I find with most organizations. When I flip it, it seems to resonate. Uh, next, see this dotted line. Maybe it's not a direct line that the project manager is handing over his or her status to the ELT, but it's a dotted line. The data and the insights that they're creating, making decisions on, escalating, do directly and indirectly impact uh, that leadership review. And the key here is uh, we need to communicate that ROI. Uh, 
the value is being seen because of the input uh, at the beginning or the investment of that input. Another example is with timesheet users. So oftentimes we communicate, just do your timesheet, you know, it, it's four clicks, it's easy, don't worry about it. And then when they're late, we ping them, right? When we're communicating timesheets, we should be describing what the value of that is. And three quick bullet points or elevator pitch really do resonate when we're talking to a timesheet user and the maybe complaints and the data quality, the complaints would greatly reduce, the pain would greatly reduce, and the data quality would greatly increase. Just understanding the whole point of doing my timesheet, even if it's only five minutes a week. All right, so this ROI and concept of value pulling effort and consistently communicating to all groups involved is key here. Uh, and then last, we focus on the what, right? And again, we spoke about this in the org readiness last month, but first we're kind of setting the stage, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and then the actual what, the clicks or the views or the specific uh, tool components or the, the actual meeting is the smallest part of it. And once people understand the overall context and the rhythm, uh, they're much more likely to follow it uh, and add value to it. All right, this is the rhythm. There's also things we can do from a design perspective in regards to making their interfaces simpler, uh, more intuitive, et cetera. We're not gonna focus on that today, but that's all tied in here too, right? Usability uh, is absolutely at this point. All right, so the MOS, again, is all about people doing processes that process. So we're not machines. Uh, it's not necessarily um, only static. We need to mix in some art here, and we need to mix in some feedback loops. It can't just be handing over a Visio diagram and thinking someone understands how to do project management, <laughs> right? It's policies, procedures, interactions, meetings, contextual, uh, cadences, et cetera. Here's, a, here's an example. Again, I just showed you um, an operating uh, cadence and rhythm. Here's another way to describe that and I encourage uh, us to communicate in any way possible <laughs> to get our point across. As communicators, it's our job to make or help the listener uh, consume, right? It's not our job to speak to speak. Our job is to speak in terms of them being able to consume. So there's lots of different ways to speak. Uh, there's lots of different ways to communicate. Uh, this is just another example. If I need to start high and I need like a logo or a really general infographic or a really uh, basic concept flow, I can do something like this. And simply, no matter who I am, if I'm a project manager, if I'm a portfolio leader, if I'm a business person, I can look at this and within a few seconds, kind of get it, right? I see the portfolio leaders. I see the PMs managing their projects. I see the portfolio managers offering uh, support and escalations. I see the system being used. And then I see the, the business leaders being involved at the end, right? This along with more detail goes a long way. By no means I'm saying stop the Visio or stop the RACI or stop the uh, Excel files and the detail step-by-step step and the UAT and the training and all that, but I am encouraging you to do a top-down view and then go into the details. So my next quote, high-level understanding will enable standard terminology and consumable de details. Real world is less about being totally right, right? Uh, we, we can be very righteous and know that we're following perfect PMI or we're following perfect out-of-box TPM or following exactly what my organization has told me to do. Even if we are, quote, right, it's not about that. It's about what's right for now, what can be consumed. All right, so even if we want to deliver uh, huge capabilities, if all we can consume is low-hanging fruit, <laughs> that's what we do. I have a fun story. When I was a customer, this is maybe five or six years ago, uh, my boss and I got in a little argument because we were we were looking at the art of the possible, and we were uh, defining an overall project status and then portfolio 
schedule, very similar to the examples we showed before. And we were hemming and hawing and getting probably too much feedback regarding a couple fields on a status report. We've all been there. <laughs> and my argument was, listen, we're about 95% there. Let's get it out there. Try it for a couple of weeks. Then we can enhance. Uh, his opinion was different. <laughs> but over just kind of having those discussions and arguments, um, we ended up putting out that status report. Uh, and maybe it wasn't 100% perfect. He was a bit more of a, um, um, in a positive way, a micromanager and detail-oriented than I was. Uh, but I knew if we could get it out there, it would find value and benefit, and then people would start asking for it versus us pushing it on them and seeing if they would like it. And that's exactly what happened. And from then on, that was the approach we took for our maturity. So instead of talking about grandiose, high-level things, we'd reference those and then say, we can deliver this low-hanging fruit in two weeks or in three weeks at the enhancement level. All right? Here's an example of a video. We've all seen this. This is very important, but it's important to include all of our communication chains and our swim lanes, everybody included in the ecosystem here. You can see on top I've circled, I still have a call back though to that high level. So when I'm communicating this, this is across pretty much anybody's eyes until they really get into it or until they're really like, this is their thing, right? They're super interested. But what they can understand quickly is, oh, we have on the left, some level of project initiation. Okay, that makes sense. All right, here's how you do that. Then we have some level of project management. Okay, that makes sense. Then how do I do that? And then I can uh, click in. Then we say, oh, we have some oper operationalization and closure, maybe some value realization. Okay, that makes sense. How do I do that? Right, so simple ways of communicating are able to resonate with our customers. Uh, here's more. This is getting into detail, right? But instead of using an Excel spreadsheet, I included this little infographic. Uh, so we, deep, we identify or we do a deep dive on one process step. This one is a portfolio status. So we identify our input in a few bullets. We can do more details in an Excel, right? Uh, we identify the actors and the actions. We identify artifacts and tools, and then our outputs and our purpose. Oftentimes, we just talk about the steps or the input, but we don't talk about everything else. Right? So these are not full infographics, but these should be able to be pulled out uh, and communicated at almost any level. And then detail is the click-in. So consider multiple process styles, then stick to standards that resonate. Some things are going to um, be more popular than others. And we all know executives uh, can be very particular. Uh, so find what his or her kind of vibe is and try to make something that interests them. Or with uh, timesheet users, same thing, right? See what really hits. Maybe it's a little poster. Maybe it's a little uh, infographic. Uh, and try to stick to that. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Here's another example. This is one that I actually liked the concept, and I was so excited to implement it with a customer, and it fell completely on its face. I love the idea of identifying input and then understanding who, which, that. It's kind of like building a sentence or building a, pro, um, a value proposition. I think this is cool. And we go to conferences, Gartner and, and CA World and these others, and they talk in these terms. Uh, Agile speaks in these terms. But this did not resonate with the customer. They didn't see the rhythm here. They didn't see even the process steps. All right, so another example of trying it out, this might resonate with another VP or organization, um, has not resonated for me. <laughs> Other examples, uh, just Google it. Uh, on the top right are just some examples of decision trees. On the top left, here's an example of a resource management flow that I did. I did this about four or five years ago, years ago, and this really does resonate. Again, though, you can see on the top, we have general concepts, propose. So we're proposing a resource. Then below, oh, who's doing that? What are they doing? Then review. That, of course, includes different actors and different decision points. And then finally, commit. So just looking at this quickly, I get it. Uh, no matter what level I am within the system, if I'm the resource being allocated or if I'm the executive making final escalation decisions, I understand somebody's proposing, probably a PM, somebody's reviewing, probably a resource manager, and then somebody's committing, probably an RM or me. Right? 
So I encourage you, again, to find something that resonates within your organization. So the bottom left is just a screenshot of SmartArt. And then on the bottom right is an example of a RACI. I do like these. I do like tying RACIs to visuals um, just for reference uh, and kind of detail uh, training. Uh, they're not too difficult, and they really do just going through the exercise of them, not too difficult, but it definitely shakes out any of the loose questions. Okay, so uh, failure is inexpensive and intolerable, and we've seen this, which leads to an equally impactful leadership response. By leveraging a thoughtful approach, we can build a solution for PPM, not just and PPM and bake it into our ecosystem. An example here is we can't just hire a process designer and expect him or her uh, to understand the ins and outs of our PPM ecosystem, right? We can't just hire a trainer and think that they're gonna understand all the context and answer all of the detailed questions they have around uh, a new process or a new uh, system step. And really, the last one, this by comparison is really inexpensive. Uh, and uh, the industry is proving that it's imperative to value delivery. I argue if we upfront or any time, but really upfront when we're considering roadmaps or future initiatives, consider org readiness, consider an MOS, because what we invest in then uh, will have a higher percentage of value. So, swag bag. Uh, these are kind of the key takeaways. Um, I'm from South Florida, so I'm gonna sing like Gloria Stefan, <laughs> and the rhythm, is, the rhythm is gonna get you, right? and your customers. I can't impart enough identifying an operating rhythm um, within the context of your process steps and all of your detailed policies and races really helps. Second, when high level is understood and standardized, details become consumable, right? We do have to wade into this. We can't just jump into the deep end. Uh, showing processes and details visually and in multiple ways uh, will help us uh, communicate our message People consume differently. We just have to deal with it. And then four, PPM practitioners can do this themselves. You can do this. And I would argue you're the only ones who can do this. All right? Uh, you're the only ones who can bake these processes, these best practices, these leading ideas into your ecosystem. You can't just outsource it uh, with someone who doesn't understand PPM. Okay. Lisa, back to you. Well, Eric, you really touched a nerve on this one because we've had quite a few questions come in. Um, so we'll get started with those in just a second. Um, but I think you definitely picked a hot topic this time. Uh, for those of you still on the, who are on the call, you can enter your questions um, using the Q&A question icon up there in the upper right of your WebEx chat window. Um, so, Eric, uh, get ready to get in the hot seat. Um, the first question is, what if you already have an existing, quote, unquote, ecosystem that seems broken? How do you handle awesome. that? Yeah, perfect. Awesome. And you know what? Even if it's not documented, something is something and you got an ecosystem. Even if you don't have PPM, you got an ecosystem, right? Uh, so the trick is uh, start documenting. You, we don't know what our gaps are and we don't know what we don't know unless we start evaluating it. So I would say start really simple. Um, if I have an ecosystem of ad hoc project management, for example, which is really typical, um, identify, okay, so PMI or PPM would say, what are some of the, key components of project management. Is it status? Okay, so understand probably what it, it, it is, what people are saying that it is, even if it's not documented, or what people think it is, and just start documenting. Um, start filling in that matrix, that visual matrix. That's how you're gonna find the gaps, and that's how we're gonna have the conversation. And so often, we don't own it. That makes it so difficult. So what we have to do is learn how to be influencers, right? Um, Again, we don't want to be the bearer of bad news and the world is falling, but we can identify all of those pain points and opportunities for us. And with an ecosystem, we can't boil the ocean. We cannot deliver a whole water park at once, but we can give a bucket of water. From that bucket of water, then we can move forward and build a little lake, and then we can build some water slides. All right? 
Okay. Um, good observation. So, so this kind of ties into uh, the, your answer there. Um, and the question is, these can be delicate topics. How do you communicate to different levels and get buy-in? By focusing on the value, and you can even break out the value proposition per persona. So identifying personas are really important. Um, in politics are a thing, especially around resource management or project financials, <laughs> like huge. Um, uh, but by having consistent communication, so that's why I really like that super high level. Who's going to argue that resource manager has a level of proposition and then a level of review and then a level of decision? Like, how do you argue that? And then from, the, from there, then you can break down, okay, what does that actually mean? Most conflict, especially political conflict, comes from lack of um, aligning terminology or just miscommunication. So pulling ourselves out of that death spiral potentially, that, that political kind of mess, and just being outside of that and being an influencer and speaking super high level, oftentimes uh, will garner a better result. I'm not saying it's easy. I've been in many meetings where executives, they all come in and they're coming with their agendas and they're coming to fight. But if we talk about topics at a super high level, I hear within a few minutes, yeah, 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 I agree. Then we can break it into more. It's almost an icebreaker, um, but the high level really helps in just standardizing terminology. Um, not to go too long on this, but my buddy Paul, who's presenting next week, and I totally encourage you guys to uh, participate. Uh, he and I went through this big activity last year about kind of merging our agile and PPM uh, ecosystems, right? Um, and he found uh, more than I did, uh, but it was a great observation. Like 80% of our, our issues were just around terminology and just about around words. And it was so silly when you look back, uh, but over a few months we were able to work through that. I think the same applies here. So it sounds like uh, – it, as you talked about earlier, um, is standardizing the processes and, and helping people understand the impact of their inputs um, is, is key to building that management operating system um, yeah. and that rhythm. And I just yeah. want to let people know that, that this presentation, we will make this available to you along with the recording so you can go back and, and review and maybe pick out some of the things that can help you improve the inputs um, and develop those uh, uh, develop those value propositions to the people in your organization as you continue to evolve and mature with this management operating system concept. So, with that said, um, hey Lisa, let me let me jump. Yeah, in. I wanted to include a slide about that, but I mm -hmm. included that slide. Um, but it's exactly right. Like when I'm communicating with someone doing the input, it's all about the value they're gaining, and then how easy I'm going to make it for them and how listening I'm going to be for their feedback, <laughs> right? When I'm communicating then to an person like an executive, I'm talking about uh, data quality and how they're going to use it to make better decisions and that we can um, pivot uh, if they need different information or a different view. So to go along with that, this is, this is kind of an interesting question here. So um, when you have a lot of changes, how do you start and how do you build a management operating system, um, especially around those input questions, from an unsure foundation? So it sounds like it's not a very stable or consistent organization, and I think you, you touched on that, but how would someone go about building that from, from an instable or unstable uh, standpoint? Yeah, I, what I found, it had the visual where I was describing kind of the string and that ELT meeting pulling all of the work to the right, I think it has to be that. If there's ever a question why I'm doing something or like, like doing a timesheet, for example, or um, uh, this is changing, the question and the, um, every decision and communication has to be around why, what the value is and why we're doing it, right? So uh, even if I have a new executive every six months and they question a timesheet every six months, <laughs> Um, we still have to consistently communicate, listen, the timesheet is used in the ELT meeting, period. If we want to change it, simplify it or enhancement, what is the value delivery of it? Like, what is the ROI? 
because anything that we do in regards to change is an investment. Anything that we do in regards to an input is an investment. And if we have investments right now that we can't articulate the purpose of or the value of, let's get rid of it, right? Or let's consider getting rid of it. Because every investment should be tied directly to their opposite side of the coin, which is the output. So what it sounds like is that um, a lot of the work is done on the front end, thinking through just exactly why the process matters, um, what the business outcome is going to be on the other side, and how you would articulate that to every person along the way, because that becomes the motivator for the accuracy and the compliance um, around those inputs. And, and that's really where the improving um, improving data comes in, right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. And if I may go back two slides, that's what this is describing. Um, it, the value delivery, that's that data, right? That's that rich data. Um, but if we think about it up front, it really is inexpensive uh, as compared to doing poor things throughout the life cycle and then ultimately having poor data. So it is that upfront thought process. Uh, that truly helps. When I meet with customers, the first thing we do is talk to an organizational readiness approach, what we spoke about last month, as well as a high-level MOS. And this does not come overnight, but the concept of it and the whiteboarding of it uh, really can uh, be the start. Okay. Um, also, also with yeah, the organizational ahead. approach, like most of the artifacts for org readiness is reusable, right? So we we can define an elevator pitch and then reuse it whenever we need it, depending on the audience, whether it's an intranet site, whether it's a training, whether it's an executive meeting, uh, whether it's in the elevator, <laughs> right? <laughs> we can create, uh, we can, uh, create a little infographic. We can predefine uh, what kind of the two, three bullets are for benefits to a timesheet user. It's faster for you and you're gonna do a good job, whatever. We can define so this, those two or three this, bullets but up front and then just reuse throughout any medium. And this sounds like it gets back to those those three pillars that you talked about earlier with the that definition step that's that's so vital yep. that I think so many people miss along the way. Um, and you know the other thing is that we we have people listening who are from um, a wide range of enterprise sizes. And so I, I can yeah. relate to this one um, from, a, from an organizational standpoint. Are there certain roles um, that can help getting started with this concept um, in, in my organization? Now, they don't specify a size, but it sounds like uh, there might be a mix of roles or personas, and, and who do you bring into the process early on to kind of set, you, set yourself up for success as you're adopting this, this new approach with the operating system and the rhythm? Sure. Um, and it's funny, when you were just speaking, I got this visual. We can't run. Um, uh, without tying our shoes first, right? <laughs> that's, that's kind of the whole concept. So long as you're not tying them together, because there's <laughs> well, always... <laughs> um, but to that, yeah, um, I've seen small organizations and large organizations with these ecosystems. Um, ultimately, they're the same artifacts uh, and concepts. They're just scaled differently. Um, so for a smaller organization, um, we would just identify our top few personas. Maybe it's the head of the PMO, and when we say PMO, it's like three people, right? Or uh, maybe we include, because we're not going to do full resource management, we include someone at the executive level who maybe we will never do, um, or maybe we'll only ever do a, a level of centralized resource management, so we don't need to get down into the weeds um, with those people managers. So at the beginning, I would encourage either a true core team um, if you're going to kick off an initiative. But if you can't do a formal initiative, dotted line that. And if people are interested, and oftentimes people have vested interest, and even if they're really upset or really excited, those are the people that we want potentially in our, our core or subcore team. And I would encourage some level of proposal uh, before it's, or, or some level of thoughtfulness before it's proposed to a greater audience. Because Project management, resource management, financial management, portfolio, et cetera, 
it's been tried and done and oftentimes failed, and everybody has experience with it. So having a really simple few slides, this is our approach based on what Eric told us, <laughs> no, uh, based on our, our knowledge as um, practitioner experts. We think we can do this, and our approach is going to be start small. We think we can do this value for you. Then potentially, if you like it, we could do this value for you. And then from there, um, it's all about the followers, right? It's all about we push it out once, but then people are going to start demanding from us. There's, there's no leaders without a follower behind him or her. So just a comment on that. So, so really, um, it, improving the poor data doesn't start with the keystroke. Really improving it starts with the thought, thoughtful consideration of why you're doing it and how you're going to communicate it at the very beginning. And, and, yeah, and being really strategic about what you're going to, you know, when we make an investment or we, we have ideas, we're putting our skin in the game, right? So just be really thoughtful about biting off small chunks. Great. Okay. So, uh, and I, I think you, you may have already touched on this one, but um, how can we keep track of an ecosystem when we have constant change? So keeping it simple. Um, and again, if, if we have a monthly meeting, getting that cadence in. If our, for example, ELT meeting is changing, that's probably a systemic business process issue beyond any control that we have. And this goes back to us owning the tool, owning the people, or owning the process. Oftentimes we don't own any of it, and we have to be influences, influencers, right? Um, so, so documenting as appropriate, but not over-investing in the minutia if that continues to change. Focus, it's all about, I wrote a blog last year about this, how do we focus our investments? Is it to simplify? So maybe um, we're going to work, my team, two people are going to work this week with the PMs and maybe uh, remove one click from their weekly lives, right? Maybe it's investing in a new module, right, that the business is asking for. Uh, maybe it's doing nothing, okay? So if we're at a spot where we recognize we don't have control, there's no business need for it, um, then we want to find somewhere else to invest our time. Great. Well, thank you, Eric. It's it's always so much fun to talk to you about this topic um, because it, you're passionate about it, and I know that everybody who's who's listening is as well. So, wide range of experience. Thank you for being today's featured expert, and uh, be sure to follow him on Twitter at PPM Warrior and also on the PPM Insights blog, where you can continue today's conversation in the comments. Also, check out the CA PPM community on CA Communities. Well, we're going to see how many times I can get communities in a sentence. Uh, and that is at communities.ca.com. So thank you again for joining us today. Join us again next month, second Thursday, for another PPM Insights topic. Uh, next month, we're going to be talking with Paulo Barrick about PPM and Agile. So uh, thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.